Amen. Matthew 21, the first 11 verses, and then we would get into this very briefly. God blessed us this morning with a great word, and I'm trusting that he will speak to us again. Now, let's read it. Now, when they, they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, okay, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Lose them and bring them to me. Okay. Verse 3. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed opportunity, privilege, and the time to sit under your feet to hear you speak to us. Instruction, direction, guidance. Your word tells us that the word of God is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. I ask, O oh God, that your light will shine in our path this morning. Let it be a lamp to our feet. Let it bring us direction, illumination. We pray, O oh God, that no one in this place will leave the same. At the sound of this voice and your word, let there be transformation. Let there be restoration. Let it be an uplifting. I pray, O oh God, that every head that is bowed down will be lifted up in hope. I pray that the broken shall be mended. I pray that the tired will receive strength from you. I pray, O oh God, that you use me, these lips of clay, and speak your word through me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may please be seated in God's wonderful presence. And I am speaking on what I have captioned, the ride of a lifetime. Say the ride of a lifetime. Say it today. I am getting a ride of a lifetime, and I'll never be the same. Amen. The word that the Lord gave us um, in this year, oh, and I was on the flight with Nate. It's good to see you, Nate. I was yeah, on the same flight with Nate from Africa to the United States. Good to see you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know, but I saw Nate and I have to say something. All right, so <laughs> the, word, the word of God for us in this year is manifestation. And you have heard this word over and over again. The reason we repeat, the reason, you know, the best form of teaching, we are instructed and told that, you know, the, first, the best form of learning is in repetition. You know, that's why teachers repeat. And you will hear us say all of these things over and over again because the word must register. The word must register. The word manifestation is a very important word. And that when you take it in the verb form, to manifest, to, to manifest, have other synonyms like unveil or avail or to display something, to show forth something, all right? And so when, when the Word of God says in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 19 that the annexed expectation, the honest, can we have that in the Passion Translation if you can do that? The annexed uh, um, um, manifestation for creation waits in eager. Okay, the entire universe is in is standing on tiptoe. That is like they are eager. They are they are standing on tenterhooks. They are um, in a place of expectancy, looking like like um, a suspense movie. You know, you are in suspense. The world has been in suspense, looking, waiting, what's going to happen, yearning to see the unveiling. That is the word manifestation. The unveiling. That is the word uh, um, I'm revealing. The unveiling um, 
of God's glorious sons and daughters. And you're part of the glorious sons and daughters, those who are saved. Amen. And the world is waiting and is yearning to see what will come out of us, manifesting what God has saved us from. Amen. And that is so key because we live in the time where we see this happen. There is so much chaos. There is so much confusion in our world today. There is so much, and you are all witnesses. It is, it is shown on our big screens. It is in books that we read. I mean, even a day old will know that this world is in a confused place. It is just like what it was in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, when the Bible says that there was confusion on the surface of the earth. The whole world was in darkness, and God took a, vis a visitation, or God visited, God took residence in the chaos. And the Bible says that the the Holy Spirit hovered or moved over the surface of the earth. And then the word was spoken. And God says that, let there be. And there was. Amen. And, and that is the kind of world that we are living in. It feels like there is chaos, confusion. But God, God has been moving by his spirit. Amen. Amen. Are we here? God is moving by his spirit and he has made manifest. He first made manifest by giving us that word that was spoken in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. John chapter 1 says almost the same thing as was said in Genesis chapter 1. And he introduces the beginning. And he says that in the beginning, there was God in the beginning. What it means is that before the beginning. Now, when you are talking about something beginning, it means that it wasn't in existence before. It wasn't, you know, this. Nothing was there, but then it began. But Genesis and John tell us about the same thing, that in the beginning, before the beginning existed, there was God. Right? And so God was in the beginning. God was the beginning. He is timeless. He has no beginning. He is the beginner of the beginning. And he's the end of the end. But he tells us, John tells us that in that beginning was the word. And that word in that Hebrew and then also by the Greek is logos. Logos means logic. It means knowledge. It means it is in, in the mind. So in the beginning, that word, which is Christ, was in the beginning. What it tells us is that when God spoke in the beginning, he was speaking the word. But it was only in an idea form. It was only in logic. It was only in the mind. God spoke the word. There's nothing that exists that exists by itself. It was existed or came into existence by the word. Now, theologians have gone back and forth in the scripture, and you realize that it doesn't say that in the beginning there were gods or there were other words. It talks about the fact that there was only one in existence, which means that God by himself revealed himself. And that is where the doctrine of the Trinity come from, where we talk of God being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are not three entities. They are just one person manifesting in three areas. I'm teaching a little Bible school here. Does that, does that make sense? And so God himself, just like every one of us, I am Joseph. Joseph is my name. You see Joseph here, but Joseph is a trapetroid being. In that, Joseph carries a spirit and a body, I mean a spirit and a soul contained in the body that makes me one. My spirit is not separate from my soul. My soul is not separate from my spirit. The three make me one. So I'm talking to you and I carry a soul. Within my soul are my emotions. Within my soul are my thoughts. Within my soul are my feelings, my everything that is in the person that I am. But within that soul, there's also a spirit. And that spirit is the breath that God breathed into man when man was created. And the Bible says that man was without form. So God breathed himself into man, and man became a living being. So when he said that let us make man in our image, he was talking about the fact that this is who I am. I am God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Spirit in one. And I'm making man just like myself, and man will carry my breath, which is my spirit. 
I felt like I lost you for a little. <laughs> and so, and so man became a living being, mean that in Hebrew, in original translation, it could mean that man became a speaking being, just like God is, because we are introduced to God as a speaking God, saying, let there be, and there was. And so he spoke, and things be. All things became, but they were all in the same God. And so John in John chapter 1 introduces us to the one who was in the beginning with God, not separated from God, but God himself, but in the form of the word. In the beginning, in the Old Testament, he wasn't fully known. He was partially known because in the Old Testament, it was still logos. It was still the mind. It was still in the mind. And so the Old Testament did not really know Christ as the word. They knew God as the one who speaks the word. But John tells us in the verse 14 of John chapter 1. That now the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. What it means is that what was Logos has now translated and has been unveiled and is now manifest. What it means is that it is touchable. It is tangible. We don't know him partially. We know him fully because he's God. And so when God or Jesus is praying and he says that I and my father are one and he's talking in and praying in John chapter 17 and he says that just as I in you and you in me and we are one so let them be one he was introducing us to the fact that the God who was in the beginning has now come in the fullness Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says that when the fullness of time had come which means that everything from creation was waiting for the fullness and the manifest, manifestation of this Jesus. And so when that time had come, God sent forth his son, the word, born of a woman. Why? Because he must come through the vehicle of humanity. Manifest. And so Jesus became manifest and he go back to verse 14 of John chapter 1. He who was first the word has now become flesh. And he is doing what? He dwells amongst us. Jesus is manifested with us. He is living not only by us, but he is living within us. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. You are the branches I am. The vine, my father is the vine dresser. Anyone who abides in me bears much fruit. Without me, you are nothing. So he's saying this, that manifestation is now here and it is in you. I have, oh. <laughs> Am I making sense? And so when we talk about manifest Jesus, what John says in the scripture is that, oh, put that scripture on, put, don't, don't leave it on. Now, now everyone say, say with me, and we beheld his glory. And so the word did not only become flesh, but we beheld, which means that we saw. We have seen him. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is manifestation. Now, just as we beheld, and John is talking about someone who was an eyewitness to the beholding. Because he is God, the beloved, the, 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 the one that Jesus really loved. So he's talking about somebody who really experienced and had an encounter, a walk with him and all of that. And a lot of the times, you know, John will write and talk about the fact that, you know, he was the one that was loved more than anyone. Because why? He was a writer. 
And he could say that because of the personal experience he has had with him. In that same way, the day you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were translated from being an outsider and to, and to being invited now into an insider who is not only coming to the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, and being taken outside to the outer court, but by the break or by the tearing of the curtain that separated us from the God of God's people, we have gained access and we have now become heirs of the kingdom and wherever we stand, whether in our bathroom, whether in the kitchen, whether in our cars, in any place, we can call him Abba, Father, we can call him our King, we can call him our Master, we can call him our Savior. Why? Because he is manifest in us. And as he is in us, so are we to the world. So when Paul, by revelation, tells us that the world, the world has been waiting for the manifestation, the unveiling. What he's saying is that, what are you guys doing? Huh? We waited several years for Jesus to become flesh. And he's coming dwelling, dwelling in you, but you are hiding. He says, no, 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 no. You can't have Jesus and be hiding. The same word that became flesh is now in you. So the world wants to know the word through you. Manifest. So you can be a Christian. Remember what Jesus said. Who lights a candle and puts it under a table? You are the salt of the earth. <laughs> he says that if the salt loses its saltiness, they throw it and people step on it. No, no, no. We will not allow anybody to step on our salt. We must manifest Jesus. The world must be savored by us. The world must be seasoned. We are the spices that make the world what it should be. We are, we are the, what are some of the names of those spices that you, what? Saison. We are the saison for the chicken and for the, for the meat and for, for that stew that, that the world must enjoy. Maggi cube. <laughs> I just, I just came from Ghana. I just came from Ghana. Just from the Ghana. We, we, the, the world must taste of this God. So when the psalmist said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How can they taste what they have not been served with? The world is waiting to taste of God's goodness, of God's favor. And they are not going to taste it from the sky. They are going to taste, this, to stay, taste it through you. Yeah. Deuteronomy 30 says that, listen, the word is not up in the, in the shore, in the sea. And you say that, oh, send, send um, some, some ships to go and bring it. It's not far away from you. And you say, that, oh, send angels from heaven. It says the word is in your mouth. The manifestation is in you. You must manifest it. Christ must be seen in us. We must walk into train stations and things must change because we are there. We must walk into airports and things must be changed. The one plane that is targeted with evil, we enter and by the salt and the light in us, things are altered. We go into classrooms. People that are into, into occultism, people that are into witchcraft, they encounter us and they encounter the power of God. Why? Because we carry Jesus. The power of God is in us. He said that those who will believe in me will do greater than I did. It always baffles me because Jesus, you are saying I'll do greater than you did. You raise the dead. You heal the sick. And you say, I'll do greater if I believe? And he said, yes, you will. Why? Because I am in you. And these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will raise the dead. In my name, they will pick up serpents. Do you know how many serpents you picked up and could not bite you? 
Sometimes we think it's just the physical and all of that, but you've picked up some deadly things, poisons that were designed to kill you, but somehow they woke up the next day and you are still alive. Somehow they came to check through the window. Is he still breathing? And you were breathing. They came through and checked and your children were still alive. They tried to take you. Why? It is the Jesus factor. It is the Jesus, the power of God that is at work in you. I wish I had some witnesses in this place who would know that you carry Jesus. You manifest Jesus, you manifest his glory, you manifest his authority, you manifest his power. You are loaded, you are so loaded, you have no idea. You are loaded with so much light. You walk into a room of darkness and the light turns on. You walk into a place of confusion and peace comes. You are a peacemaker. Manifest. The word became flesh. We saw it. We beheld it. People will behold the glory of God in you. Oh, you, don't, you don't hear it. I said people will behold. People will see it. You know, I, I, please allow me. I, I, pardon me. I, I, I don't, it's, not, it's not intended to bring attention to me at all. Please excuse me. And that is not what I want to do. But when I, I, when I visited Ghana, I was walking to places. And people would come and tap me and say, wow. You were here. Is that you? And they were touching me. I was sitting in the conference. Somebody walked all the way from the back, tapped me on my shoulder. Sir, can I talk to you after this service? And I was wondering, they, they don't even know me. And, 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 and I'm walking to this place. People come and they are giving you hugs. And before I knew, I didn't tell, tell anybody I was in town. Before I knew it, and you know, I, I went to one or two places. My pictures were on, was on social media. I'm receiving all these texts. When did you come to town? Are you here? Can you pass through my church? Somebody said to me, he said, can you just show up and say one word in my church so that people will know that you came through my church? And I was like, wow, is that what I have become? What it means is the glory of God that is in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You must begin to manifest Christ. It is not in your doing. It is not by design. It is not pride. Paul said, even if I'm boasting, my boast is in the Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. If he could take somebody like me and put his glory within me and let the world see it, I came to tell you that there is power, enough glory on your head. You will break out into... Oh. First Corinthians chapter 1, 26 and 29 says that God has taken the foolish things. For you see your calling, Brendan, that you, that, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many, but God has done what? Chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Listen, what he's saying is that you didn't even matter. They thought that you were nobody. They thought that you would not amount to anything. They know your background. They know where you come from. They know your parents. They know your mess. They know how you sinned. They know how you smoked everything from grass to bamboo. They know how you could drink yourself into sleep and you wake up and you are still drunk. You drank so much that even when you tasted water, it was like alcohol. They know your story. But look at what God has done. God has taken the foolish things of the world. What the world looked down on. What they trampled on. He has taken you, translated you. And he has done that to silence the wisdom of this world. Manifest. Jesus will be glorified through your life. Am, am I speaking to church today? I feel like uh, I feel like something is stirred up in me because the time to play catch up is over. The world must know that we carry Jesus, we carry His anointing, we carry His power. We must walk in this confidence. Go to places they said we couldn't go. To enter into doors they said we couldn't enter, and just show up and tell them we carry Jesus. Somebody shout! I manifest Jesus. 
manifest Jesus. I 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 manifest His glory. We beheld His glory. I manifest His glory. His light, they looked to him and they were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. I manifest Jesus. Moses came out from the mount. They looked at him and they said, this is the glory of God. I manifest Jesus. They listened to Peter preach the word and they said, ah, who are these ones? They have never been to school. They have never sat in classroom. These ones haven't been educated. These ones haven't been to any university, but they are speaking the word in authority. They speak the word in boldness and they inquired only to find out that they had been with Jesus and because they had been with Jesus their lives had been changed listen you cannot be with Jesus and remain the same you cannot be with Jesus and walk like the same old person you cannot be with Jesus and not have your language changed you cannot be with Jesus and have your life walking in mess if you have been with Jesus you will manifest Jesus you will manifest his love you will manifest his glory I came to speak to some 20 people in this room who are ready to walk in this manifestation. Maybe 30, maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe 200, maybe 300 who are saying that it is my time to show forth His glory. If I were you, I would lift up my voice and shout, manifest! Oh, somebody shall I have the ride of a lifetime. Now, that's the title of the sermon. I don't know if I introduced it. Because that ride is going to be good. Uh, oh, I'm going to have the master ride on. I, I'm going to be the donkey and he's going to ride on me. It's a lifetime change. Oh, great change in me since I met Jesus. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found out. I manifest Jesus. It's a ride of a lifetime. The world must change their mind concerning our faith and concerning who we are in Christ. They must see us and they must know God. The perception of Christianity must change. We manifest Christ. We manifest Jesus. So let me sum up the scripture that we read and begin to release you into your day. I don't know where all those things came from, but yeah. Have you been blessed already? Because somebody need to get out into your week, go back into that office space, go back into the classroom, and your walk must change. The way you carry yourself must change. The way you speak must change. People must say, what happened to you? You have this swag around you right now. You're, you're dripping different right now. You are, you are, your, your drip has changed. Like you, 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 you have this thing about you and, and, and you have seen the light. The light of God is reflected in me. You are asking, oh, but you have issues. Yeah, 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 no. But those problems and those issues are nothing compared to the glory that is living inside of me. Yes, I might have pain. Yes, I might have some misery, but I have Jesus. That is enough. I might lose some things, but I have Jesus. I will manifest His glory. I'm in pain right now but yeah I have Jesus and that alone is my glory I am broke right now but I have Jesus and that is enough for me right now I may have failed some exams but yeah you know I am coming with my swag because I have Jesus the failure doesn't it doesn't describe it's not de defining my end I may have fallen seven times but I rise again seven times I go in the power and the glory of God I show up because I manifest Jesus Oh, I'm feeling this. I miss you all. 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 Somebody say, I manifest Jesus. Listen, you must have this confidence. 
in you. Paul said in Philippians 1, 6 that, you know, uh, uh, I'm confident of this one thing, that he who has begun this great work in me. Listen, whatever great work God has begun in you, he will complete it. Because, listen, I've checked his word and I know that he never starts anything that he doesn't complete. If God started, he will complete it. If God called you saved, oh, your end will be good. My beginning might not be so sweet and so good. But I know that he's not a man that he should fail. Neither is he a son of man that he will repent. Has he said and will he not do it? God will honor his word concerning my life. So I am going to keep on Keep it on. He will finish it. Are you hearing me this morning? I'm confident. I'm confident. Confident assurance. Bold declaration that he has begun this good work. I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work because my salvation is glorious. You don't know how he saved me, but it is glorious. I am the biggest miracle the world has ever seen. By my salvation, by my deliverance, I am standing here as a testimony. That is what must become your song. Let people look at you and say, what is this thing with you? I have experienced his glory, a glorious work in me, and he will faithfully continue the process. I am a process. I am like that cake that is still in the oven. I am like that bread. I need to, I need to brown a little bit. You know, he's waiting for me to, you know, he wants to make me that soft. And, you know, like I went to Ghana and I was eating this nice, the best bread in the world. This tea bread. And when you touch it, it's so soft. And, and it's powdered with some white stuff. And, you know, you touch it and you know that, mmm, they took their time to bake it. Listen, God is taking his time to bake you and make you real good. You are going to come out. The world will taste it. Am I talking to church this morning? I feel like God is turning things around for your manifestation. You will manifest. Someone shout, I'm a process. I'm a process of manifestation. If, if you've ever seen a basket being weaved, right? Those of you who are into, you know, you've seen baskets. Usually when they are making the basket, uh, it's not pretty. Because you see from the outside, because those that are making it, they weave it from the inside out. From the outside, you don't see the beauty. All you see is pointed, you know, these things that, you know, they look ugly. But the one who is making the basket inside it, weaves it. Weaves it out, weaves it out, and when it's done, he puts in and cut and trims it. And on the outside, when you hold it, you're like, hmm, is this the same thing that was looking ugly? The outside looks ugly right now, but he's working something in the inside. He's, oh, you are going to come out as a finished product. You know, it, it doesn't come with ease, but I am a process of manifestation. And your glory, listen, people will see you and they'll see the glory of the Father. And so, back to my word. Being at this, oh, look at that. Oh, we have the best media in the world, I'm telling you. You know, where I come from, when people want to say things, they write it on cars. When they want to insult you, they write it on cars. And so, there is one that you see, it says, travel and see. If you haven't traveled, you think you are, the, you are the champion of this village. But when you travel, you'll be like, ah, ooh, all along you have been a village champion until you step out. Travel and see. And I, if you travel, you know that we have one of the best media teams in the world. That's it. It doesn't make sense. This is what Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10 says that we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship. We are his poema. Poema. We are his poetry. God has taken time. And you know, this, 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 what looks not nice. Uh, um, is this the scripture? Philippians. Philippians. Uh, Ephesians. I beg your pardon. Ephesians 2.10. I beg your pardon. Ephesians 2.10. Not Philippians. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand. God has taken his time to mold you, right? He's making you into your manifestation. 
it doesn't look nice right now, but behind the scenes, he's finished it. And so, this week, Palm Sunday, now beginning to go into the sermon itself. <laughs> so, if that was not a sermon, what was that? <laughs> Introduction to the sermon. But this, this is going to be very brief. Because I need you to catch something I shared this morning. In this scripture in Matthew... Matthew writes about it. I took my time to read. And please do me a huge favor. This week, this week, do yourself. And I do that every time around these Easter. I go back to the gospel. I go back to the right and there. I begin to read the stories of the, uh, of the, the Easter story. You know, read it from Matthew, Mark, Luke. Read it. Get a fresh understanding. And I've been doing that. I, you know, when you, anytime you go into it, you get like deep revelation. It is never boring. The word of God is fresh manna. You can read John 3.16. If you read it every day, every day will give you some different thing. Because you allow him to give you freshness in his word. And so take time and read it. But when you read this Easter, this Palm Sunday, the Bible talks about the fact that, you know, it started on the eighth day. And on this, this day, you know, is the beginning of a long week for Jesus. Very, very long week. Start with the celebration. Between today and next Sunday, so much was happening. Today, they were singing Hosanna. They were shouting, but you know, everybody around Jesus, they didn't understand what was going on, but Jesus knew. He knew what was ahead. He knew that this might be my last praise him, praise him, Hosanna, Hosanna. Nobody was going to be raised from the dead. Nobody was going to say he has, t he has fed 5,000 with, with, with five loaves of bread. All of that was not happening. You know, nobody is going to say, oh, he turned water into wine. This week was a different week. It was a week of purpose. He had been prepared for it. For 30 years, you know, we, we, we know. Is it okay, media, for me to step down? Uh, Maj, am I okay? Uh, I'm okay, okay, okay. They warned me. I'm back, you know. Said it's difficult to catch me on the camera because they are chasing me. Where is he? He's gone. Oh, where is he again? But, so say, Pastor, stay in one place. But Christmas, we hear of Jesus' birth. Everybody is excited. The Messiah, he is born. The Magi or the Magi or the shepherds, they are bringing gifts to baby Jesus. The world is at a standstill. There's celebration. Then suddenly after the birth, we don't hear of him. Then one time we hear him going to church with his parents and they can't find him. And they find him and he's listening to the elders. He said, my son, where have you been? He said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I'm on, I'm on assignment. We hear a little bit about him. But for 30 years, almost 30 years, we don't talk. We don't, nobody talks about Jesus. 30 years. Where was he? 30 years of silence. People only refer to him as the carpenter's son. They said that carpenter's son. So they opened the door for him as a carpenter's son. But he was being prepared for something great. And it happened in the third or in the three years after the 30 years he's introduced. And in the three years, the fullness of his ministry and every assignment is fulfilled in three, in three years. 30 years of quietness. Please hear me, ladies and gentlemen. God will hide you for the greater part of your life for you to be manifested in a short time. The fact that it has taken longer doesn't mean that God has forgotten. He is working on something behind the scenes, your manifestation. As a matter of truth, the true manifestation of Jesus' assignment happened within three hours. The Bible says that from midday, 12 p.m. to 3 p.m., that was when the entire history, the entire purpose of his coming was fulfilled. Three hours! 30 years, nothing being heard. Three years, he's healing the sick, raising the dead, doing miracles. Three hours on the cross for fulfillment. Please hear me. Whatever your assignment is, whatever your calling is, God will take his time to process you for your manifestation. 
That is why I've personally learned rejoice. I've come to the place of being so sure of this that there's no delay with God. I preach it confidently. I say it boldly because what you call delay, the Bible says that a thousand years is but just last night. God will compress time. If God wants to honor his word in your life and bring to pass what he has said, it doesn't matter the calendar because you live in the chronos. God live, lives in the kairos. And so you live within calendar. You calculate days and times. God is timeless. And when God is up to your case, it might be within an hour. It might be within two hours. But what he does best is this. He compresses time for your sake. So Jesus is about to be revealed. His ministry is coming forward and it starts on a Sunday and people are coming out and they are, they, they are excited. But my sermon starts with some three things that I want to live, live with you. There are three P's that you must have. You know, minister, I don't think we have come to fully understand the power of the Easter week. We have watered it down. We, we, are, not, we are not being taught well about the Easter week because if we really understand it, our whole concept and understanding of our faith and our work with God will change. You get to understand that between the A and the Z are so many things that will not be explained. But definitely if he started an alpha, there will be an omega. <laughs> started on a Sunday. And the Bible says that Jesus is the best one of Matthew 21. Now let's walk through the scripture. I'll walk through so that I can finish quick. The verse 1 says that now when they drew near Jerusalem... They came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. May I stop here and make an announcement to you? Jesus desired to go through Jerusalem. Please hear this. This afternoon, this, is this the morning or afternoon? Whatever time it is, Jesus is desiring to go through your Jerusalem. And for some of you, that Jerusalem could be your marriage. For some of you, that Jerusalem could be your finances. But Jesus is desiring. Jesus will pass through your city. Jesus will pass through your life. There will be a fulfillment of his word. He would desire to see you. He would desire to come your way. He would desire to visit you. He desired to turn things around for your sake. Can I get an amen? amen? But the Bible says that he went through. And then in verse 2, that's where we get the first thing. He said to them, go into the village opposite you. And immediately you will find a donkey tied. The first P that you must have, if you're going to have a ride of a lifetime, on this Palm Sunday and the rest of your days, is in the word place. Everybody say with me, place. place. Go into the village. Go specifically into a village. Now, what is the definition of a, of a place? A place is a location. A place is a location. What is a place? What is a place? It is a spot. It is a venue. Now, many people want to be used by God, but they, want, they don't want to stay in their place of assignment. The donkey was tied for a reason. Am I coming through? Okay. I'm trying to. Jesus was only able to use the donkey. Why? Because that donkey was tied to a place. What do you think would have happened if he had said go? And they went and the donkey was not there. Missed opportunity. Missed blessing. The donkey was where he was supposed to be. At a specific place. At a specific time. There are many people who want to be used by God. I said that. But they don't want to be tied to a place. 
God really wants to use you, but he's asking, where are you, Adam? I left you in the garden, the place of promise, but you have left your place of promise. I heard your voice and I was naked. Adam, you've always been naked before me. Have you left your place of connection? When you leave your place of connection, you wander about naked. Because the covering of God with you is missing. I'm trying to. You have a place of your blessing tied to a place. Many of you, many Christians, they are not at their post. God is looking and crying for you. Where are you? You are nowhere to be found. You have left and you are moving from location to location. Prophet to prophet. Church to church. All over, all over social media. Everybody is your, your, you're fooling everybody. And this person speaks well. This person is a prophecy or a prophet, whatever they call it. This one is an apostle and all of that. All you do is looking and moving from your place. God is looking for you at the place. Why aren't you tied to your post? Will your, will your master really find you? Where are you? There's a place. Somebody say a place. Jacob was running, moving, carried a blessing. But the Bible says that until he came to himself and located a place, took a stone, laid his head on it. It was in that place that the heavens opened and God said, Jacob, I was with your father and I'm with you. What I said to your father, I will do the same with you. Why? Because you have found a place. He woke up and said, hey, so God was in this place and I did not Know it? Please hear me. Your place of connection could be in your assignment, which is not too pleasant, but God has tied you to it. Why am I doing the same thing? Nobody's even noticing me. It's a place. Nobody is calling me to preach anywhere. It's a place. Nobody, I feel ignored. It's a place. It's a time for your manifestation. For 10 years, I felt tied to a place. 10 years. 10 years. I was serving. All I had was the ministry I was in. People would come in and say, Hey, Joe, pastor, you, this place, you shouldn't be here. You are bigger. You are this. I said, this is my place. Until the master calls me out and tells me what is next. I am not moving by the, wom- by the voice of women and men or by anybody's voice. I am waiting the voice of the one who named me, called me out of my mother's womb, gave me an assignment. He said, before you were born, I knew you. I called you a prophet. There's a place you must stay. Ten years I was tied. I saw my friends doing big things. But I was tied. Tied to a place. Until God said it was time for you to go. And I wrote a letter to my pastor. I feel like Abraham being told to leave his, cant- his family and go to a place that he didn't know. I said to my pastor, I don't know where I'm going, but God is sending me out. He said, son, we will pray for you. It was a difficult place because I had grown to love my local church. I loved them. That was all I had knew for all the years I'd been in the United States. That was the only place I had served. Faithfully, loyally, I served. When people were leaving, I stayed. When people were speaking against my pastor, I, sp- I stood for him. I stayed with him until God said it was time to leave. I didn't know. I left. I didn't know it was for ministry. God sent me out. Sent me to go learn. Ten months I was walking about learning. Brought me to a place to sit down. And I was learning. Not knowing that there was an assignment on my head that needed to be unleashed. But it comes with obedience. Listen, I said in the morning, God will never give you your next step of instruction beyond your first step of obedience. Many people want the finished product, but they don't want to stay in the place of promise. 
You want to be used, but have you stayed in the place of training? He's teaching you. There are so many things that I've come to understand in ministry now, and it's because God held me down, caused me to stay, to be tied like the donkey. There's an assignment. Wait, the pastor, will, the master will have need of you, but until the call comes, this is your place. Today's generation, we don't know how to wait. In the days where everybody wants to become an apostle. 20 year old, 21 year old, 22 year old. You are calling people my son, my daughter. Who fathered you? And my son, and my son in ministry. My son, what, what have you learned? Will you be tied to a place to learn? Huh, they are not using me, so I have to go and start my own ministry. I need a microphone. I need that. So you go and buy in these, in these days, cheap phone, cheap something, camera. You put it on you in your room and you call yourself something and begin to, I'm prophesying to people. Prophesying where? Tie to a place and serve. I'm sorry. Yeah. Me, at this age, I still feel like I'm learning. I never go to my spiritual father and try. No, I, 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 I want to learn. Tied to a place. This week he told me, he said, ah, but you cry. Wouldn't you get tired? Don't you get tired of serving me? I said, for what? When I'm, I'm, I'm around him, I'm a house boy. It doesn't make sense. People receive you. People call you this. I said, no, I'm first a son before I can be called a father. Where are you rushing to? At 25, you want to become an apostle. At 50, what will you become? <laughs> At Pope. At Cardinal. The race is not to the swift, ladies and gentlemen. Me, I tell people, they say, I want a mic to preach. I will give you to it and you will stand here and the, the, like my, my father will say, that your eyebrows will, sh will change positions. Give some of them. No, they say, Pastor, how do you do it? Yeah, five minutes, the sermon was done. 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 Ten minutes, they were done. done. They say, how do you do it? Say, you think it's, the, it's grace. Amen. Be tied to a place. Amen. Learn processing. Amen. Wait. You are not in a hurry for anything. Oh, I'm seven minutes over my time already. Who changed the time? Be tied. The donkey was what? Tied to a place. Be tied. You know what it means? It means that sometimes in that being tied is discomfort. To become so like, oh Lord, when? But you know the beautiful thing about it? Zechariah 9 9 had prophesied, Zechariah had prophesied that this, 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 this donkey will be one that no one has sat on. And for that donkey to remain like that, it had to be tied. Be tied. Allow yourself to be tied by God to a place. Sometimes you could be doing something that nobody even wants to see. I get you, Delapo. I get you. Thanks for the sign. Thanks for the warning. Get you. High five somebody and say, please be, be positioned at your place of connection. Can you, can you be rude and ask them, will the master find you in the place he left you? Will he find you? The pastor, I got tired. I got tired of waiting. Nobody noticed me. Everybody, I'm a prophet. God, 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 yeah, yeah. Well, prophesy. <laughs> People come to me and say, Oh, pastor, what if you know your ministry is a prophet and an apostle? I'll be tied to a place. It's no rush. 
When will I be used? Stay there. Be called names. Stay there. Tied. Since the work began, I was telling them this this morning. You saw me travel now. This is the farthest I've gone in years. God will not let me travel. Lock me down here, tied to this work. I couldn't go anywhere. People invite me, and somehow I said, No, this is this is it. God will not, He shut me in. There were moments of restlessness. I'd missed my mom. I hadn't seen my warm mom. Let me go see my mom. God said, There must be a place of being tied. My children could never enjoy vacation. Why? Because there must be a place of being tied. 24 years, 22 years, they've never gone anywhere. The only place they went to, and even that one, they had to be at ISI. We were in ministry. Then I rented a car. I said, let's drive to Florida. Let's go to this new something for all of us to have a vacation. For once, I sat there and I was in tears because I had deprived. My children hadn't enjoyed vacation like families. You do. You take your vacation. You take your families and you are in Europe and all of that. And you come and I pray blessing for you. I was tied to a place. <laughs> tied. Tied like a donkey. Tied. God, where will you and when will you release me? Tied. Tied. And say, but why is he traveling? Why is he going for two weeks? Uh, really? <laughs> Tied. And I thank God he gave me a wife who understood the calling of God. She, she desired, she was doing her master's into PhD when God pulled her out to come and support this work. She let go of all of that. Why? Because a young man says God has called him to a church and he had nothing. Tied. Allow yourself to be tied. Let me go to the second point. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, this is good. So I should say some more. No, that's okay. That's okay. Go, go and reflect on it. No, this, this generation is a rush. Everybody wants to, you know, and this social thing has, I mean, the social media is powerful, but we are allowing it to destroy us. This podcast, this, uh, um, everybody has a word. And, and, and this is a fresh revelation God gave me. What revelation? Because you can afford a camera. Be tired. Stay and steady. Stay and be processed. Stay and not be given anything to do. It is a process. I told him about Clifford. I told him, I said, listen. Somebody told me, he said they were going to ordain him. I said, you are not going to be ordained anywhere. Not that. I, was, I said, no, 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 no. You just got saved. You travel and somebody says, hey, there is ministry in you and we are going to ordain you to go and start ministry. I said, that is, that is, that is a, a, a suicidal uh, uh, plot. I told her, I said, son, hurry out from that country. Come right now. Take the next available plane. Run this place. I told him. He said, come on, stay. And when he came, I ignored him. I had to intentionally ignore him and I told him you must go through the grind. You must go through processing. Stop prophesying. At the point I told him, stop prophesying to people. I said, don't prophesy. Not that I don't believe in your gift, but have you been processed? Because listen, this thing is heavy duty. Standing here with a mic, speaking over God's people, you don't know the exchange that goes on. Stay! I hear him preach on social and I'm like, eh, really? You should have gone, you would have seen. (laughs) 
I came back telling myself that I'll be very brief. Because last week I was watching Pastor, Pastor Mike and it was like 45 minutes over the time. Now, I like what media does. They put it on the screen. It's time. Or time is up. And so I'm glad they haven't put it I'm back. Do you better not put that thing up on the screen. I saw it today doing the I said, time is up. I said, wow, things have changed in this house. But, but are, are, we, are we being blessed on a serious note? Okay, okay. The second thing, the second in verse 2. Verse 2, the second thing. Verse 2 and 3. I, I am out of your way. The second P that I want to give you. Everyone read with me. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately, he will send it here. And then, you know, what, what is important in this place is, is the second thing. And it is called posture. Everyone say with me, posture. Or pasture. I said posture and said pasture. What, what is pasture? You know what pasture is? P-A-S-T-U-R-E. I'm talking about P-O-S. Posture. Posture. There's what? Pasture. Pasture. Whatever. My tongue, I just came back eating some fufu and banku. And so I am back to the African tongue, the Ghanaian tongue. Allow me to say posture. Pasture. Whichever one your tongue allows you to, based on your language, based on origin, pasture. Pasture. I can't even say it right. But by definition, it's a state or a condition at a given time, especially with respect to some capability in some particular circumstances, a state or a condition. Now, that donkey was in a posture of readiness, tied. He was in a posture, tied for the timing of the master. You need the posture of a servant. Readiness, tied, be serving at that place. You are tied, but that is the posture that the Lord is looking for. He said, you will find there will be many donkeys, but this one is tied. It's in a posture of readiness. Please, excuse me, posture, posture, whichever one sounds good. But at least I'm talking about the P-O-S-T-U-R-E. And the reason Jesus could identify this one was because it was at the place of assignment and it had the posture and readiness for service. I've, I've, I've learned it in a hard way, Pastor Cooper. Everybody, everybody, every Christian, as I said, say, many Christians, they want to be free, but no, none of them want to be used. You want to be ready? No, you don't want to be used. You must allow yourself to be used in order to enjoy the freedom. After all, he didn't save you out of the world of darkness for you to become all of that and bounded. No, he, he, he saved you so that he will serve through you. So that the world will know through you. He said the master has need of you. Can you tell somebody by you? Look into the eyes, blue, white, yellow, brown, based on how tired they are in life. And tell them the master has need of you. The, the master has what? Need of you. You know why? Because there are broken people around you. And their, their brokenness... Their healing will only come through your availability. Yeah. That is why I like Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. That says that the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I will know how to speak a word in season to those who are weary, to those who are broken, to those who are tired in life. Salvation, deliverance will not fall from the sky. It will fall through you. How would they hear? Until, if they have not heard. May God use you to be that servant. And make yourself available. Tell yourself be available. For the master's use. Will he still find you? Tied and ready for your assignment. You know, availability, two words. Avail and ability. 
you have to avail in order for your ability to be used. And the ability is what God gives you. The availing is what you do. And God will not have, you see, there are so many things that God has, has access to everything. But until you give him your availability, you will not enjoy his usage. You have to be available. Number three. Verse eight. Verse eight. Verse eight is the last one. Have you learned something? You've learned a lot? This Palm Sunday will be one that you will never forget in your life. I'm telling you, this Palm Sunday, you will never forget this one. Because after this Sunday, you will be ready for God. And you'll be so much used by God that sometimes you yourself will be surprised at how your life has been transformed because you made yourself available to the master. In this verse, the Bible says that and many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down their, uh, cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Said some, Someone says spread them on the road. They brought the donkey and the coat and laid their clothes on it. Now, you know the word that, the, the next P that I have here, it's called passion. Everyone say with me, passion. What is the first P? Number two? Pasture. Number three is passion. Passion is by definition an intense driving or overarching or overmastering uh, feeling or conviction. You have this deep and ardent affection for something. You must have the passion. And the passion is translated into another word that I like to use. It is called burden. Your passion is your burden. What are you burdened with? What is it that you want to carry? The donkey's passion was the carrying of the master on his back. To the donkey, it was a weight. But he didn't know that out of the weight flows his blessing. Because as he carried the master, blessings flow to him. Today, several years later, we read the story of uh, Palm Sunday and the donkey is mentioned. Why? Because when they were spreading the, the, the palm branches and the clothes, who was enjoying it? It wasn't the master. It was the donkey that was stepping on it. To him, he was carrying a donkey. I mean, he was carrying the master, but he was enjoying the blessing. When you allow yourself to be passionate and carry the burden for souls, God will pour you out and pour down on you blessings that will overwhelm you. What you haven't even thought of, what you haven't even known, will flow to you. Why? Because you have allowed the master to ride on you. You are like a donkey. You are like a servant. You have become so lowly. You have become so humble. Father, that I decrease and you increase. As you decrease and God increases, glory flows. Power flows. Breakthroughs flows. His mercies flow. Everything you, you need is flowing. Why? Because the burden is for his work. You are burdened for souls. You want people to be saved. You want people to come to Christ. That is a burden. You are burdened for his assignment. You are in church seven when everybody is turning away. Why? Because that is my passion. And as you carry him, he gives you the blessing. You know, somebody said uh, in a very funny way that the next day after all of this was done, the donkey came out again and then came to the same place. And when he came, nobody noticed it. People didn't even recognize it because this time the master was not on his back. And we said, ah, what happened? Yesterday, all these people were hailing me. They were throwing their blankets and their towels on the floor and I was stepping on them. But I came today and they don't even recognize me. That is what happens when you get Jesus off your back. When, when you put him off your back. If, when, you, when you lose the passion for his work. You think you want to be noticed. You strive to be noticed. But nobody will notice you. You strive to do it by yourself. Why? Because you have let go of the master trying to do it by yourself. But as long as the master stays on your back. The glory and the grace and the power and the favor will follow. This morning I release upon you passion whatever is dead in you come alive again passion for his work passion for ministry passion to serve and the Lord God will honor you somebody shout passion, passion. stand on your feet I'm done